welcome to our third and final webinar in Hope Farms 2022 webinar series, Agroforestry and Nature Friendly Farming. I'm Georgie Bray, the Farm Manager at Hope Farm. It's great to be joined by farmers, conservationists, scientists, and of course, accepting that all of the above fields are not mutually exclusive, with well over 200 people signed up for this evening. So thanks for that. Um, the aims of these webinars are to provide perspectives on what we do from all of these perspectives. Um, and so, it, but it may seem odd to be sharing a webinar on agroforestry at Hope Farm, given that the last trees for our agroforestry project only went in the ground a matter of days ago, or the last ones did at least. However, there's no time like the present, and I'm sure that many of you joining us today feel the same way, perhaps with some people considering trying agroforestry yourselves. That's why we felt the need to share our lessons along the way from this project at each stage of its journey. And perhaps more importantly, share the fountain of knowledge that we've only just started to tap into so far. I think this evening we are collectively joined by over a century of experience in farming, trees and agroforestry between the speakers and panelists. I'm really looking forward to introducing all of these people to you. But first off, a few housekeeping points. Um, so the session is recorded and it will be available to view after the webinar on the Farm Wildlife YouTube channel, along with previous Hope Farm webinars from this and last year. Um, this is a webinar um, where your video and your audio has been disabled, but you still have full use of the Q&A box to put any questions. Um, you'll find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens, so please post any questions that you have um, and that will be monitored by my colleagues. We'll then answer all of those once the presentations are finished when we come to the Q&A session. Please note that depending on time you may not get to all of the questions, in which case we'll look to get back to you after the event with a response. And finally before I start or we start, I'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers and everyone behind the scenes for helping to produce another what I hope will be a very successful webinar. And so we're going to start off with something a bit interactive, something a bit different, um, with a word cloud that has been set up on Mentimeter. So if you follow the link that Claire has just put in the chat, um, which you will find a link to at the bottom of your screens as well, um, I'd just like you please to input three of what you think are the most important things that farmland should deliver on. Um, I know that's quite tricky to limit it down to three, or it certainly would be for me, um, but Claire is then going to share her screen and we will see what pops up to different people as the most important um, things for farmland to deliver from your perspective. Okay, so we've got food in the center. Brilliant wildlife, ecosystem services, carbon capture, biodiversity, public access, yes, and well-being. So that's kind of social things and supporting rural communities, so communities, environment, food, biodiversity, and ecosystem services certainly coming out tops there. I'll have a look at some of the smaller things. Money, yep, it's got to be a stable business, otherwise the farmers can't be expected to manage the land as part of their business and jobs there um, for nothing or at a loss. I'm going to leave that another few seconds and actually I'm going to leave that now whilst I just go through the rest of my introduction and we'll see what comes up there. We can share that um, with you as a report afterwards as well. Um, so this year our webinars are reflecting the positive way that farming is going, looking at nature-friendly farming and how we can try to help farmland deliver on so many different levels, um, which I think have been well reflected um, with that survey. So thank you for participating. Um, so yeah, farmland is perhaps traditionally seen as land for producing food to feed the people, which it is. Um, however, the demands on farmland are so much bigger than that. And to look at three quarters of the UK's land with just that goal really limits the opportunities to use land to its best potential. Uh, the original reason for buying Hope Farm 22 years ago was to show that Hope Farm could run as a sustainable business, grow food and look after wildlife profitably. 
Um, now, that even that seems a rather simplistic model that we set out just by taking out marginal corners of fields and looking after boundaries alongside pretty intensive farming in the field centre. Now farmland must deliver on so many fronts, as you can't find more land to satisfy the needs of everyone living in the planet. We've taken enough of that up already. Um, but farmland must continue to provide food, look after wildlife, whilst helping to reduce the carbon footprint, promote, promote healthy soils, healthy water, and provide social benefits as well. Um, at Hope Farm, we try to satisfy all of the above best we can now in a world that sits in a climate and nature crisis and with more demands on it than ever before. I won't go into the details of how we've done that as quite a lot of it's been explained in previous webinars, but regenerative farming practices and true integrated pest management are what we think are the solution. We try novel techniques, which I will be honest, I'm not really original, but begged and borrowed or stolen from other practitioners and researchers to see how they work for us. So with that in mind, an arable agroforestry system is an idea that we've stolen in the context of us looking at how we can diversify our business, reduce our carbon footprint and look to continue to look after nature on the farm whilst producing food and other goods. Um, I hope that sits the scene for why we're here this evening. I'm really looking forward to the speakers we have in store for you, explaining a bit more about the Hope Farm project, about the research into the impact of agroforestry on biodiversity and perspectives from pioneering practitioners, professors and other conservation organisations um, on agroforestry for nature friendly farming. First up, we have our very own Sophie Mott, the Carbon Farming Project Manager at Hope Farm. Sophie has been at the farm for a few years now having first joined us as a student investigating cover crops, soil and earthworms as part of her zoology degree. Um, she since assisted on the Elms test and trials before coming back to Hope Farm as the carbon farming project manager. Here Sophie's investigating carbon calculators and reviewing how they may work to assess um, farmers carbon footprint and reduce it alongside a lot of research, digging, and lugging around all sorts to get the agroforestry project in the ground to date. So with that, Sophie, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Georgie. Um, that was a lovely introduction, <laughs> me digging things around. Um, let me just share my screen. That. Georgie, can you just tell me if you can see that? Yeah, that's all good. Ready to go. Grand. So as Georgie said, part of my role has been implementing our agroforestry trial on Hope Farm. And we have got fabulous uh, practitioners coming to speak after me. So you'll have to just muddle through my presentation first as we are the babies in this on this webinar. We are, as Georgie said, about three days into completion of putting our trees in the ground. Um, but actually, I still feel that we have learned tons about this just in the planning and implementing of it and getting to this stage that I hope sharing that will be useful to anybody who's thinking about this sort of thing. Um, so I will just tell you about what we've done at Hope Farm. So um, seeing as I'm the first speaker, I thought I'd better off start by just sort of introducing the topic of agroforestry a bit more uh, broadly. So I've stolen this pretty little diagram here from the Soil Association's Handbook of Agroforestry, which is a really, really great read for anybody thinking about getting into this. And as you can see, agroforestry really sits in the middle here of trees and shrubs and farming quite nicely. Um, so what is agroforestry? Well, Quite broadly, agroforestry is a land use that incorporates trees into farms and allows for the production of trees and crops and or livestock from the same piece of land. It can be silver arable, can be silver pasture if we're talking about a bit more intensive systems or really broadly agroforestry is any sort of woody material that you have on farmland. So a lot of farmers and a lot of you watching will already be agroforesters in terms of the fact that you have got hedgerows or you have got small copses or woodlands on your farm. But what we really like to think about when we talk in agroforestry is the silver arable or silver pasture, so the really integrated systems. 
So where does agroforestry go on a farm? The answer is anywhere if you're talking about the really broad uh, terminology encompassing. If you've got hedges and edges, they can be agroforestry. If you've got awkward corners that you plant up into small copses or woodland expansion, that's agroforestry. If you've got lots of livestock pasture and you turn that into wood pasture, that's agroforestry or silver pasture. And if you've got arable fields like we do at Hope Farm, you can pop that into alley cropping, which is what we have done. So a little bit of why we're looking at agroforestry, what we're interested in about it. So agroforestry has a really huge range of potential benefits, which we're really interested in investigating. So the first one is air. Um, trees have a really big impact on air pollution and air quality. They can do a good job of recycling and cleaning air that way, but also gases in the air. So we know that trees are a fabulous way of sequestering carbon dioxide, which is one of our um, prominent climate change gases. Um, and they can really help to work towards that solution. Agroforestry in, can also contribute to soil health. So trees are a fabulous way of increasing your nutrient cycling ability. They're very deep rooting and they do a really good job of keeping that cycle moving through their leaf litter and the permanence of them. So you can't cultivate through a tree or anything like that. You create a really stable soil system under your trees and the leaf litter um, and the root systems and things like that can really help to improve your soil structure, your carbon content, your um, ecosystem under the ground and all the good things that we want in a good soil system. It also has potential benefits for water quality. So um, having trees through a field is going to slow down a lot of runoff when we get flash floods or a lot of rain. Um, and those really deep rooting structures and improved soil structure is going to help water drainage down into the soil where it can be kept and held, increasing your water capacity of your soil. It does potentially have some benefits for your farm economics, depending on what you're looking to achieve with your agroforestry. So you can go down a production route, which is what we've done with ours, where you're actually increasing your cropping. I do apologise if you can hear a cat screaming. She's sat behind the door. Um, and also, there are also some indirect economic benefits, potentially in livestock systems, um, which brings me on to my next point of this very, very happy cow that um, in silvo pasture and wood pasture, there is a good amount of research showing that if you're selecting um, agroforestry and tree systems that have potential browse benefits to your livestock, you can get increased welfare and increased medicinal benefits. You also get increased shelter and shade protection, so you get reduced heat stress, um, reduced wind effect and things like that. And then the last one I've got here is that there are definitely potential benefits to our wildlife and particularly our invert populations. So as I said, these are a permanent feature in your field, they're perennial. Um, most of them or lots of them flower or fruit in some form and they provide a food, uh, a nesting or hibernating resource for a lot of insects, invertebrates and even some of our larger wildlife that we like to see around the farm as well. So moving on from broad agroforestry to what we are specifically doing. So we are an arable farm, we're 181 hectare arable farm at Hope Farm, so we are looking specifically at alley cropping. So we've chosen an 11 hectare field. We've chosen 24 metre cropping alleys that are split with six metre tree lines that were first established with a wildflower mix, which is what you can see in my photo here. So this was the wildflower mix established in the six metre margin before the trees went in. Um, last summer and you can see the crop alleys is the yellow side either side of that. We have put three types of tree in this field so we've put in a shelter belt because we do um, we are in the Cambridge Cambridge Claylands where things are pretty flat and you can get quite a ferocious wind built up there so we've got a shelter belt in first which consists of all native species so they are hornbeam, field maple, wild cherry, common alder, hawthorn and small leaf lime. And then we've got some production trees in here as well. So we've got over 200 apple trees in this field that are on a dwarf uh, MM106 rootstock. And we've got 13 different varieties in there. 
And we've also got some cobnut trees. We've got nearly 600 cobnut trees in this field of three different varieties. Cobnuts, if you don't know, are a type of hazel. Um, now, things to consider. This was a big thing for us when planning this. We didn't realise how much we didn't know, put it that way. Um, and we spent a lot of time planning and things kept cropping up that we thought, oh, need to think about this. Oh, need to think about this. So these are all the things that I could have dragged out of my brain that we had to think about lots when planning this and changing it time and time again to make sure that we were happy with how it worked with our system. So things to consider for the field, your machinery and your row width. So as I said, we've gone for 24 metre cropping alleys. That's because 24 fits quite nicely with all of our, say our, our contractors machinery. He's quite happy that he can fit his drill, his sprayer, his harvester, um, anything in that in the cropping alleys without too much difficulty. Your operational timings. So we're an arable system on heavy clay. Um, our timing windows for when we can get on and off of our land are crucial for our cropping operations. Um, and we need to make sure that the agroforestry that we're planning doesn't interfere with that. Our field orientation, so the field that we've picked is, I will show you a map later on, is quite a nice um, sort of rectangular field, um, runs on the north-south axis in terms of its um, sort of sloping and how we would run tractors down it anyway. So that leads really nicely to a north-south tree line, which is the ideal way for us to plant those trees because the north-south orientation of the trees is gonna reduce the shading either side out onto our crops. Um, and for us, this was a concern or something we wanted to consider. It may or may not be for you, but we wanted to make sure that there was some public access and visibility to this trial. So we have got a public footpath that runs along the edge of this field um, because we really want to use this as an engagement point with our local community. And our um, we obviously do a lot of farm visits and a lot of engagement work with policy and farmers and a lot of advocacy. advocacy. So that was important to us. It might be oppositely important to you in that you want to try something like this away from prying eyes and people that might think it's a nice opportunity to walk up and down your field without permission. Things to consider for the trees that we had to put in the ground. So things we had to consider here was our soil type. Not all trees like all types of soil, so we needed trees that would tolerate heavy clay that is prone to being particularly wet in the winter and particularly dry in the summer. We also had to consider our end product. What was the point of putting these trees in? What were we aiming to get out of it? We had to consider whether we stick with native or whether we include commercial varieties. Um, as I said, our shelter belt trees are all native because they are not production trees. Um, and their primary job is to provide for biodiversity and to act as a windbreak. But in our apple trees, we have got a good mix of native and commercial varieties. Um, because this is a product and this is a cropping product and we need to make sure we are producing a bumper crop for that to be um, economically viable. We also had to consider our operational timings and harvest. So we have picked all of our apple trees that are early, um, early pickers. They'll all come to harvest in uh, September because again, we don't really want to be trying to get on and off of this field at the wrong times of year or when we've got crops in the ground um, in terms of in the alley cropping. So we don't want to be trying to travel on there at the wrong time of year. Um, the growing time and the productive life. So what this is kind of tied in with your end product. If we were looking at producing timber or something that's got a much, much longer growing time, um, that would be something that we needed to consider. Um, and the planting and maintenance is a big, big consideration. So you can't just put them in the ground and then forget about them. And actually just putting them in the ground isn't, isn't very simple as we've learned over the last few weeks. Um, they do take some maintenance, they do take some upkeep. And then things we have to consider for the business, the initial cost and the investment, um, it hasn't been particularly cheap for us to put in. It's not the same as planting a hedgerow in terms of costing an investment. Sophie. Yeah. Sorry, can I give you a one or two minute cut off? Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, so yeah, then the time required to plan and implement the end product and your supply chain where you actually want this to go. Um, planning out your return on investment. 
and any additional labour and ongoing management that you will need. So this is the layout of our field. As I said, you can see this quite nicely lends itself to a north-south access there. So what we have got is this 11 hectare field. We've got lots of wildlife habitat around the edge where we cut off all good corners anyway. Um, we've got um, trees pretty mixed up in here so that we've got a good variety of things all together. What you can also see in there is our sampling points. So this is an RSPB trial and we are monitoring this very heavily for the next 10 years. Um, so you can see our sampling points there. We have got sampling points in the tree strips at 12, 36 and 108 meter into the field. And then from those tree strips, we are measuring in the tree strip, three meters and 12 meters into the crop. So the things that we are measuring are plenty. So we're looking at biodiversity in all its forms. So we are looking at worm counts. We are vortice sampling, which is basically a big bug vacuum, which takes above ground invertebrates. We're tree beating once the trees are grown up, pitfall trapping, bat monitoring, butterfly transects, pollinator counts, the vegetation structure in the margins. We're also conducting full CBC breeding bird surveys and winter bird surveys. Our carbon monitoring, we are taking carbon measurements at 0 to 15 and 15 to 13 centimetres at all of those sampling points and vegetation carbon sampling points at all of those points as well. So not just in the tree lines, we're talking about in our crops and we want to see how far this affects into our cropping field as well. And the other monitoring, we are looking at our yield measurements of our crops in the field um, and our sort of crop for gone by putting those permanent strips in. We're looking at potential weed burden into our crops. So we've planted these lovely margins with wonderful plants and we want to check if that has become, could become a problem into our crop. And we want to have a good look at our soil. How is that changing into our crops as well? Um, and the input changes for crops or trees. So if we potentially see any IPM benefits by putting this in our cropping field, we might see a reduction in, I mean, we don't use any insecticides anyway, but we might see changes in herbicide juice or anything like that. And then the thing that I think a lot of people will always want to know and will always ask is some costings. So here is a bit of a rough idea of what I'm talking about with this initial investment. So, so far on this field, just in the things we have bought in to put in the field, we have spent 16 and a half thousand pounds of various things. You can see the production trees, the nut and the apple trees are considerably more expensive than the shelter belt trees, which are your more typical sort of hedging trees. Um, but there is a reason for that. They are going to produce some produce um, and they take a lot more love and love and care to get to the point where they got in here. Sorry, then, Sophie, can I cut you off? Can I just can I just finish this product bit? I'll you can. You, I'll let you I'll let you finish that. Um, so then we also had the wildflower margin establishment was about a thousand pounds year before last all of the guards and ties and the compost and wood chip that we've used for mulching is about another four thousand pound on top of that um, and that doesn't include any man hours of actually planning it or putting it in the ground um, so for planting and guarding and staking we've spent about 300 man hours um, so far and this is how it looks currently. There's a little Georgie in the corner there, um, putting our final guard on. And this is where we are up to. Little baby trees, all in guards, feeling good. I do apologise, Georgie, I am done now. No, that is absolutely fine. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. We're having to run it like a military operation this evening, I think. Um, nevertheless, uh, thank you very much for giving an introduction to what we're doing at Hope Farm. It's very much at the beginning stage. And, but looking forward to seeing the results of that monitoring in years to come. Um, so next up, we're going to go to someone who has so much more experience than we do. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Professor Stephen Newman. Um, Stephen is a senior natural resource climate change and climate finance consultant. He's undertaken over 122 major assignments in over 63 countries. The work included managing over uh, managing many multi-million pound investments in agroforestry and nature-based solutions worldwide, um, leading to the planting of over 10 million trees. He's that really does dwarf our 1,000 that we've put in this year. <laughs> um, he's a managing director for the Biodiversity International Limited, visiting professor in Agricultural Department at Reading University and the fellow of the Institute of Welfare Reform. He is 
part of the Abacus Agriculture and is advising UK farms and estates on profitable nut tree agroforestry options. He's co-editor of the leading textbook on temperate agroforestry systems, now in its second edition, and he also wrote the design chapter in the Soil Association's Agroforestry Handbook. With that, I really look forward to hearing Stephen's words on agroforestry, picking out some key mistakes and key pointers for how agroforestry can work. Thank you, and over to you, Stephen. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah, that's all good. Okay, fine. Um, so I'll try and share the presentation. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, that's smashing. All right, so I'll make a start then. Thank you for that. So um, basically, I want to share my top five mistakes, really. Um, and hope that they're useful and we can have a discussion. Um, so background again, 42 years experience in different periods. In the 70s, looking at orchard intercropping, showing that land equivalent ratio can equal two, meaning that you can get the same amount of pears and the same amount of radishes um, from the same area of land, you know, so it's like stacking two things on top of each other. In the 1980s work to develop the test the models on silver pasture and then the network design and there's now the, the national network. 90s looking at silver arable systems with poplar for food security plus bioenergy so to show that energy is not competitive with food. 2000s agroforestry is a nature-based solutions in the context of climate change. So linked to a global portfolio of work on that. And then since 2010, looking at the estate scale for high value bankable agroforestry, you know, so this doesn't need the grants. This is stuff that stacks up on its own. Um, nuts, acorns, quince, mulberry and truffles, things like that. The idea of an auspicious mistake came from my work in Bhutan. It means a mistake that what they said leads to a ticklish question. It never goes away, it just drives a new way of seeing things. So it's a, it's a very useful thing. Um, so nuts, you know, so I'm now known as the biggest nutter in Kent. Um, so <laughs> uh, nut agroforestry is multi-dimensional. You're gonna get income from the land while retaining flexibility of continuous agriculture. A revenue stream within an agricultural time scale because we can get walnuts you know starting in year three and hazels maybe four or five stability to link to being perennial doesn't need annual replanting incredible range of ecosystem services increase in the asset value of land if it's done carefully and it's a great platform for impact and socially responsive investment funds um this is something that we started in china that's my research student leading leaning down measuring the wheat um paulonia is great because it just leaves so late you can see this the, the spring wheat's already senescing and these leaves have just come out we get ler of two um and um incredible you know without those trees this was in um Anway province without those trees there wouldn't be a crop there and you know they're improving the soil and improving the microclimate so oh, that, sorry Stephen could you just explain LER very quickly yeah so land equivalent ratio is um to see what um you know so an LER of two means you'd need a hundred percent more land to obtain the same yields from monoculture so if you have, if you have, expect five tons of wheat per hectare on a, as a sole crop, or five tons of walnut, um, then if you combine them together on the same land and you still get five plus five, that is one. So that's LER of one's not worth mixing them. But what we find is if we're doing things carefully, we get LER of two. So you'd need twice as much land to get the same yields from monoculture. Um, hope that's clear. Um, okay, um, some pictures. 
we grow hazels as single stems and these are very different from the traditional Kentish cob nut production system. They're free husking, we can shake the trees, use mechanical harvesting. There's a harvester that we use. We can, we can use that to sweep up walnuts, hazelnuts, acorns, a whole range of things very quickly. Um, you know, in terms of products, the sky's the limit. This is just a sample of French walnut products, mustard, you know, pickled walnuts, wine. Um, my partner's just dyed her hair with walnut and it's incredible. Yeah, so it's an amazing tree. Right, so these are some of the top 10 challenges you might find. Um, we'll probably have a discussion about this at the end. Getting decent advice, um, getting a proper strategy for UK agroforestry based on what I'm calling BCW 2.4 economics. In the light of Brexit, COVID, war and 2.4 degrees, that's the situation now, what should agroforestry strategy look like? Planting grants for multi-purpose trees. Currently planting grants are totally inadequate. You need at least 10 times more money for the trees I'm talking about compared to forestry. You need, the, you need to be very careful about the varieties and tree sizes. Reliable sources of plant material in quantity. Non-plastic approaches to trees, establishment and protection. Thinking very carefully about the configuration, you know, it's not just alley cropping, lots of different opportunities. Processing and marketing partnerships, absolutely vital to have a partnership even before you start. Estimating and getting paid for carbon sequestration, well, still seems a bit wild west to me, but we'll maybe discuss that later. And then, you know, there's looking at agroforestry as a nature based solution on a big scale uh, with water and flooding, you know, green infrastructure, peri urban areas. These are very exciting. Right, finally, we got to the main point of the talk. So, the, the framework, the paradigm we operate in now is economically attractive, climate smart agroforestry in the context of concerns about UK wildlife and food security. For me, you know, food security is key. Um, so what are the mistakes that, you know, I've, I've made hundreds of mistakes and that some of them are intentional because that's the nature of research. Some of them were. Right, so I'm really sad now after 42 years, I've ignored oak. When we work, you know, what the original modeling work with the Forestry Commission, they said just focus on the medium type growing trees of sycamore, cherry and ash. Now we realize just how valuable acorns are. So I'm eating carbon negative acorn bread and we want to get precocious varieties of uh, oak, you know, that'll give us these acorns. Don't worry about the tannin content because we can wash that out as easy as anything. Um, but we want to start harvesting them after three years. And then the wonderful potato, I've ignored the wonderful potato um that's the ideal crop it can feed far more people per unit area than any arable crops um and it can be shade resilient recent research has shown 20 percent tolerant 27 percent shade that means no effect and we've not even selected for shade tolerance so when we can select for shade tolerance we'll find some incredible things so that means we can stack trees on the top of your potatoes and you still get a good crop. Second mistake, ignoring clumps and belts. Well, some of the mod light modeling I did early on, um, it shows that really, if you've got like a little oasis, uh, you know, a little island, a little clump, then you've got so much more light coming from the edges and you can have very high systems and the light climate in a clump is very different to an alley cropping system, which is essentially an infinite array as far as light is concerned. It's almost like an infinite array. Uh, so look to China for how to plant trees, not UK hedgerows. UK hedgerows are a total mistake. Um, if you want to do agroforestry that's productive and high in light use efficiency, um, 
look to China, you'll find out how to do it properly. UK hedgerows came from a different set of demands just to produce stock proof fences. We can, we can grow four square planting around arable fields where keeping stock in is not an issue. All of my work really has been on farm profitability. Well, you know, um, now, it's, you know, we need to reflect on economics. So look at the Treasury, look at UK PLC economics, not the farm scale. So tree link wildlife farming has major societal benefits, uh, health and everything else, you know. So look at the balance of payments, import substitution, all the rest of it. Look at wildlife farming with a clear view of what wildlife you want to produce and then then you can get people to pay and visit to visit it. Uh, but we need to reduce damage. So it's not just <laughs> laissez faire, let any wildlife come in, you're going to need to manage it. You know, in some areas now, deer are such a problem, uh, you'd need uh, it's almost not economically viable to grow trees because the protection from certain deer species can be prohibitive. Ignoring water at the estate scale. So again, you know, we're working in Essex recently, rainfall is about 500 millimetres a year, very low. So we need to look very carefully at water, you know, swales, embankments, I call it the Durian model because when I was involved in this, this <laughs> rather smelly fruit in Bangkok, they grow it in on mound, long mounds with streams running between them. So we can use streams to transport the produce. So we really need to look at the aquatic nature and the water ecosystem engineering agroforestry. Water is going to be everything. So what We'll see in, in 50 years time will be far more uh, integrated agroforestry with water, um, you know, and looking at different zones, the peri-urban zone, green infrastructure, um, incredibly exciting. The other thing, after doing a lot of work with um, all the major beverage companies, uh, Unilever, SmithKline, uh, Heineken, which own Bulmers, try to get them to do no spray orchards. We now realize after the insect biomass studies that it's not just the um, loss of habitat. There's a lot more negative aspects of sprays than we understand. So we really need big no spray zones and particularly no spray orchards. So I've come up with a model using the LEACE for disease control because um, Wild garlic can be used as a nutraceutical, as an intercrop within cider orchards. We can put a roller over the top of it and the secondary plant compounds that come off will really have a big effect on reducing uh, mildew and um, powdery mildew and um, scab. So these six things, I've made the mistakes. So it's over you, to you younger people. <laughs> <laughs> to try and think about these things and hopefully we can have a discussion at the end. So what do you think? Where do we go next? Any other ideas? So, so I hope that was useful. Brilliant. Thank you very much for Stephen. That was certainly useful. Um, really interesting to hear from someone who's looked at how to make agroforestry work financially um, raising your head above the parapet rather than just at the small farm scale uh, certainly in Cambridgeshire water levels are going to have a big impact on our farmland um, I also wish I'd only made a hundred mistakes or hundreds of mistakes in my life perhaps countless is more accurate for me but there we go um, on that note of over to over to the audience we now have some questions for you guys and we're going to do these quick fire um we'll give a i don't know 10 20 seconds for each question if that's okay and claire is going to bring those up um sort of so those questions are asking about whether people practice agroforestry or are looking to start practicing it um can you rate the agroforestry advice available in the uk at the moment 
And if you've practiced agroforestry, can you, can you rate the availability of trees and protection? Uh, we found that quite difficult in figuring out how we can try and protect these trees that we've just planted reliably and sustainably. Um, and then finally, can you rate how sustainable um, the protection of the trees is? Um, and are you happy with what's widely available? So I'm going to leave another few seconds on that. Be really interesting to hear what you guys think. Right, so let's just see what those answers are. Okay, so, so we've got about half of the people here today are either practicing agroforestry or thinking about starting, and then the third haven't had the opportunity to. Um, and only 7% are not planning to put agroforestry, so that's quite interesting. Um, quite more people think that we need to have better, more widely available agroforestry advice in the UK. More people think that the rate, that the availability of trees and protection isn't satisfactory. And can you rate how sustainable you think the protection is? That is a lot more people think it's not satisfactory rather than satisfactory. Um, that is really interesting to see. And yeah, we certainly found that really tricky tricky at Hope Farm to get reliable but sustainable protection for the trees. Um, so on that note we're going to move over to a hardcore practitioner's perspective um, and that's Jenny who is a farmer, a beef farmer, producing walnuts um, successfully from a silvo pasture system in Essex. Um, so Jenny will be introducing the Boxted Orchard and talking about how to restore the orchard and silvo pasture system. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Jenny. That's all right. I appreciate being described as hardcore. Um, so I'm <laughs> going to talk to you a little bit about the Boxed One Orchard and what we do here. So in a way, we're at the other end of the spectrum to Hope Farm. Um, so it's an example of mature agroforestry system, but we're working to bring it back into management and production without losing the environmental benefits and the special character of the orchard. So I'll just share my screen with you. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so here it's a, a brief map of the orchard. The current orchard, it's about 25 acres. Um, so it includes the only remaining example of a 1920s project to rejuvenate English walnut growing. So many of the trees are coming up to 100 years old. So there was this drive in the 1920s, which was part of an orchard competition uh, to boost English nut production. And then there was a further one in the 40s, which was looking at increasing the supply of protein crops uh, and you know this making yourself sort of security of protein crops in the UK so it's quite interesting because everything has come full circle and we're back into uh, promoting protein crops and growing them in the UK. So it's currently managed as part of the silver pasture system so we've got cattle grazing beneath the trees it's extensively grazed from spring through to the nut harvest or later depending on the weather and the conditions. Uh, the site has areas of wet pasture within the orchard which is great for wildlife obviously it's adjacent to a lake um, it's basically surrounded by woodland, which is a challenge, but um, means it's one of the largest areas of uh, tree cover locally. It's also got a sweet chestnut plantation adjacent to it and also a very small cobnut plantation, which I'll briefly touch on later. So the bulk of the orchard, um, it's English varieties and particularly local East Anglian varieties. So this is a few of the varieties that we find. We think that there are about 15 varieties across the orchard, but we're working to identify them at the moment. So I've been involved for about eight years externally and then took over the management of the harvest about two years ago. Um, so it's very much a work in progress. So at the top, you'll see the Champion of Ixworth, Bardwell and Stutton, which are all um, villages to the north of Barry St Edmunds. 
Uh, we've also got Sir Langtoft in the orchard as well. Um, we've got the Geisenheim, which are trees which are about 35 years old, which were planted by Steve, who you've just heard from as part of a research project. And then we've got French varieties, we've got the Parisian there, we've also got Franquettes, and we believe there may be up to about three or four different other French varieties, which were later replacements um, within the orchard system. So one of the things that surprises people when they come to the orchard is the diversity of the shape and the size of walnuts. So this uh, was, I did this, uh, laid these out in 2019. Uh, and this is a very, very bad year for the champion of Ixworth. <laughs> They're usually two to three times that size. Uh, and the Parisian that year in 2019, that's a very small Parisian nut. Last year, they were about twice the size as well. So there's a great variability in the harvest. So I'm lucky enough to work with two other ladies who are just as passionate or nutty about walnuts as I am. Uh, and we can identify the varieties as we pick them. But up to 2019, they were only sold as big or small walnuts um, because the map and map of the orchard has essentially been lost. So in the middle of 2019's harvest, which is perfect timing, we finally managed to locate the hand-drawn maps um, of the orchard, which were done in 1995. So now it's a case of matching up the trees to the maps, which is quite tricky uh, in places, and then confirming what varieties we have by looking at the nuts and the, uh, the shape of the shells, etc. Um, we've made a start on this, but unfortunately last year was not a good harvest and not all of the trees bore mature nuts. We weren't able to move as far ahead as we would have liked to. But I have been searching for the maps for a good six years, so it was very exciting um, to finally sort of have them in my hand and be able to walk around and try to identify where some of the trees were. So we're particularly interested in replacement trees um, where trees have been lost and we are keen to stick to the East Anglian varieties that we find in the orchard. Um, so at the bottom you'll see that's a, one of the mature trees which isn't looking as happy as it could. There is one section of the orchard which, um, which has got trees which are dying, um, so we've got to investigate what's going on there. We don't think it's a disease issue but it's possibly a, an environmental change, a land change. Um, probably relating to the wet pasture and changing the water table or the drainage. So the trees at the top top right that you can see there, so those are the Geisenheim trees which were um, planted by, by Steve, so they're about 35 years old. Um, I don't know what the trees are at the bottom because I haven't yet found them on the map. Um, there are also tree preservation orders on some of the trees. Um, despite multiple requests, we still don't know which trees have tree preservations on them. So until that's confirmed, we can't do any sort of major work in the orchard, because obviously as soon as you start work, someone will tell you where they are. But I've been told that there are definitely tree preservation orders, but they're not entirely sure which trees they're on. So that's something that needs exploring further. So the site also contains a cobnut plat, so a cob plat, uh, which we think might predate the present orchard. As you can see, nothing has been done with it for a good at least 20 to 30 years. So we've started work on it this winter. Uh, this is fenced off to animals. Uh, you will have seen in the previous, um, previous slide that there's a um, the sort of browsing line in the trees, uh, but because of the way you prune cob nuts, they would have been within the browsing reach of cattle. We're using this uh, to hopefully produce and bring back into production, but also to propagate uh, cob trees to sell. So back to the walnut orchard. Um, we do, we harvest by hand. Um, we have, I have two ladies who work with me and then other people during the harvest, but it is a very labour intensive process. The top orchard could potentially be mechanised, but we don't have full access across the site for machinery with a wet pasture, especially in a wet year. It works for us because we can, we pick as we sort, because I've got good workers who are able to do that. Um, you, obviously with that browsing line you can see it's quite low, it's only at the cattle height, so to mechanise and to bring in machinery would require an awful lot of work within the orchard itself, um, which is something that is a future possibility, but we obviously don't want to change the character of the orchard and we don't want to lose any of the environmental benefits as well. We sell the walnuts um, early season for pickling, um, but harvest time the nuts are washed and sorted and the majority are sold as wet walnuts for which we've got a good local market. As Steve touched on, uh, there are a lot of other walnut products which can be made and sold, and I'm adding walnut hair dye to the list of things to explore. We are looking at other products uh, that we can, we can develop um, at the moment, but um, predominantly for the time being, it is just wet walnuts that we sell. Finally, I'll just touch on some advantages and challenges of the system. Um, grass growth, shade. Um, 
the east of England is very dry, as we've touched on. Throughout the summer and autumn, there is an incredible amount of grass in this orchard. You can have cattle on for months and there will still be grass growing, which is absolutely mind blowing in this part of Essex. Um, just as a demonstration, I am a cattle farmer. We've got a very small, we've got 90 acres of grassland, um, which is separate to the orchard. Um, small fields, I mean, a big field for us is about six acres. We've got big hedgerows, uh, all the original hedgerows. We've been planting edible hedges for years, but I've been trying to convince my father to plant infield trees for about a decade now. Within 10 minutes of him visiting the walnut orchard, he was completely sold on the idea because he could not believe that in October you would still have that much grass after such a hot summer and autumn uh, that particular year. That obviously has benefits for you've got shade for the cattle, you've got extra browsing for the cattle, and you've got that secondary crop from the site as well. So it's sort of win-win. In terms of challenges, yep, establishing trees, it is a big expense. Uh, we're grafting some trees, particularly from the traditional varieties, but also the protection from the livestock is challenging, particularly when you've got trying to fence it off from cattle who do love to rub and destroy everything. Uh, the weather and the climate, um, walnuts you know, commonly do demonstrate alternate year cropping anyway, but this is going to be exacerbated by climate extremes. We've got a good amount of diversity in the orchard, but it's going to be interesting to see whether the orchard has the flexibility to respond depending on future climate situations. Uh, and probably the biggest challenge is squirrels. As I said, the orchard is pretty much surrounded by woodland. If you're starting an agroforestry project in the middle of an arable sort of field or arable prairie, I am incredibly envious uh, because the squirrels last year were essentially mocking me. Uh, but there are, as I said, a very few areas of extensive tree cover locally, so it is a balance and it's something that we have to live with uh, and control as much as possible. I mean, however, I would just like to say from a biodiversity and environmental perspective, and you'll hear more about that from Tom, it's an absolutely incredible site. It's very special, it's an amazing place to work, um, and in particular the fungi and lichen are quite remarkable. Uh, I've never seen such diversity of fungi locally. Um, and it's, I'm an amateur mycologist, but um, it's very exciting. It's something we're hoping to explore more in the future. So that's a very quick overview of the orchard and our silver pasture system. Uh, as you can tell, we've got a way to go to fully bring the trees back into management and production. It is very exciting. Um, it's an important part of the local food heritage, uh, as well as a good example for future agroforestry projects. And we've had people visiting who are putting in agroforestry projects uh, to have a look and see what it might look like in sort of 30 to 70 years time. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. Um, that was a fascinating insight into your farm over at Boxworth, um, Boxted, sorry and just shows I think the diversity of different agroforestry systems it's not just arable crops of lines of trees um, and that interesting idea that the old, old ideas are coming round nuts for protein is certainly not new it's just something that's being recycled again um, so keep bringing those questions in and thank you to those as well who said if there's anybody in particular you would like to ask the question too as that really helps when we do get around to the Q&A um, keep them coming in. I'm now going to move over to the back to the academic sector um, with Tom Statton um, for our next uh, talk. So Tom, I'm Tom Statton recently finished a PhD at the University of Reading which investigated plant and insect diversity in UK agroforestry systems. Today, Tom will be speaking about the findings of his PhD, specifically about how agroforestry practices affect biodiversity, pest and weed management, pollinators and farm income. Right, over to you, Tom. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so let's just get this presentation up. There we go. So yeah, thank you. Um, in, this, in this last talk, I'll be talking about um, a more specific part of research, I suppose. Um, we've heard earlier from, uh, from Steve about quite a, a broad, his, his very broad, uh, extensive experience. Um, today, I'll be talking about the findings of my PhD, which were quite specifically focused on looking at biodiversity um, particularly from an applied perspective, so from a farming perspective. So looking at 
what biodiversity in agroforestry means for things like pest control, weed control, um, and pollination. So um, I won't dwell too much on what agroforestry is because we've heard lots about that already. Uh, but this slide is just uh, to illustrate really the diversity of agroforestry systems uh, globally. Um, so they can take many different uh, forms. My PhD has very much been focused on uh, alley cropping arable systems. Um, so for example, uh, these two photos in the bottom right, uh, C and E, uh, where alleys of crops, annual crops, are grown uh, alongside um, trees, whether the trees are for timber or for fruits or nuts. So why do we need biodiversity? Um, and I'm conscious that I'm speaking to uh, an RSPB uh, webinar here, so um, you, you lot are probably very enlightened uh, on these matters, and I think we can all agree that Biodiversity is of value in its own right. But biodiversity also provides us with um, specific, uh, a specific value to society and to agriculture. So for example, biodiversity helps us with the natural regulation of pests. This is important, of course, because um, insect pests do a lot of damage to crops globally. Um, and our conventional methods particularly in recent decades, have been very reliant on the use of synthetic pesticides to, to control these pests. Of course, I'm sure many of you will be aware of the increasing environmental and ecological concerns of widespread pesticide application. And also there's the issue of pesticide resistance. So this is the concept that some species are evolving resistance to pesticides. So we're having to continually develop new products and more effective products um, to stay on top of them. So it's a constant challenge. Whereas natural pest control is seen as a more sustainable option. And natural pest control is where we try to um, use plant diversity and we try to encourage the naturally occurring predators and parasitoids of pests to regulate our pests. So here we have, for example, some naturally occurring beetles feeding on slug. And in the, right, in the right there, we have a tiny parasitoid wasp. These are really effective at controlling aphids. Biodiversity is also really important for pollination. Again, that's been in the news a lot lately in recent years. Many of our food crops are really dependent on pollination. But uh, in recent decades, again, there's been a heavy reliance on managed pollinators, particularly honeybees. But by encouraging wild pollinators, um, having a diversity of wild, wild pollinators can be more effective uh, in terms of crop pollination and can also be more sustainable um, because instead of relying on one species and having all our eggs in one basket, e.g. with the honeybees, if we have a diverse community, um, it's a more resilient uh, service. So what do we know about biodiversity and agroforestry? Well, a, a PhD pr prior, to, uh, prior to mine at the University of Reading um, aimed to, uh, aim to explore how, um, how good biodiversity, how good agroforestry was for biodiversity, essentially. And this, find that, this study found that there, were, there was much higher diversity of butterflies in agroforestry than in monocultures of arable or pasture. There were also about twice as many solitary bees and hoverflies in agroforestry, so a really strong effect. And also a few years ago, there was a, a big review of uh, studies across Europe looking at how, how beneficial agroforestry was for biodiversity. The effects were really mixed, which perhaps isn't surprising given how diverse these systems can be. But there were really strong effects on birds in particular. Um, also on average, there was high plant, fungi and insect diversity in agroforestry. So in my PhD, I really wanted to go beyond purely looking at biodiversity and start to think from a farming perspective, what are the costs and benefits of the, having this biodiversity in agroforestry? And how can we optimise these benefits and minimise the costs? So the costs include things like weed pressure or, or um, some insect pests might be more of a problem. So to explore this, um, I studied 
uh, three field sites mainly. Um, they were all in Cambridgeshire and Nottinghamshire. And each site had an agroforestry field and an arable field within the same farm under the same management and crop rotation. So this is a drone photo of one of my field sites. And in the main part of the photo, you can see the agroforestry field. Um, and just in the right, you can just about see um, some of the arable uh, control fields. So this was used as a, as a comparison. So basically we're comparing the agroforestry to the arable across the three, the three sites. The agroforestry systems were all alley cropping, mostly based around fruit trees with um, some of the sites had some other trees thrown in as well. Um, and they were all, all under sown with a flower mix, a bit like the, uh, the example at Hope Farm we saw earlier. Um, and they all grew mostly cereals and yellies with some break crops as well. So just to start with biodiversity in general, before we look more specifically, we did find significantly higher plant and insect or invertebrate diversity in the agroforestry crop valleys compared with the arable fields. And this doesn't even take into account the tree rows. So this is purely looking at the crop valleys within agroforestry. Um, so there was a stronger effect on, on the plant diversity we can see here on the left, but also significant benefits for invertebrates. So insects and similar things. So next we wanted to really go beyond that and start to look at which species benefit from agroforestry. So in other words, are the benefits universal across all species or are there some winners and losers? Are we seeing a change in the community? And what we found was that we did see a shift in the community and the community in the agroforestry fields were really more, more of a natural community. So more of a community associated with uh, forests or hedgerows or permanent meadows. So just to explain, um, the plants we found in the agroforestry fields tended to be more perennial. They tend to be more creeping rather than seed spreading plants. And also there are more later flowering species. And this has implications for, for weed management as well. So for example, a species like creeping thistle can be a bit of a problem in agroforestry if it, if it um, is allowed to, uh, to colonize the tree rows too much because that's perennial and creeping. Whereas a species like black grass, which is annual and seed spreading, is really better adapted to big um, monoculture arable fields. And we saw, if anything, slightly less of that in the agroforestry fields. Similarly, we saw a shift in the invertebrate community in agroforestry fields. So there were more um, winged invertebrates like spiders. The spiders seem to love the tree rows, um, probably because they're not very mobile. So they benefit from these habitat corridors. Also, there were more specialist or seed eating um, insects. Again, these tend to be more sensitive to disturbance. So they're probably benefiting from this habitat corridor throughout the field. And also species which require um, a year round source of vegetation like crickets and grasshoppers. And that makes sense really, um, because the agroforestry tree rows provide that or more specifically the, the vegetation below the trees. So what does this mean for pest control in agroforestry? Well, firstly, we found a higher functional diversity of protists and parasitoids in agroforestry than in arable fields. Um, and this is basically a metric which indicates a higher level of natural biological, biological control of pests. So it indicates that the predators in agroforestry are more effective at suppressing our pests. But when we looked at pest numbers in agroforestry versus arable fields. Again, we saw this shift, this change in pest management. And this graph just summarizes that. So here we're looking at a range of, um, of eight different uh, species groups. And the three species groups on the left here were all significantly suppressed in agroforestry fields compared to arable. And the three in the middle here with the grey bars, there wasn't much difference between the two. Whereas the, the non-crop plant cover and slug numbers were slightly higher in the agroforestry fields. 
And again, if we think about the traits of these species, we can start to understand why that might be. So the species on the left are more mobile, they're more attracted to certain resources in arable fields. Whereas the species on the right are less mobile and they're probably benefiting from these tree rows as providing habitat corridors throughout the field. So we also looked at pollinators. Um, the main pollinators in this country being bees and hopperflies. And here the effects were much more simple um, and there were really universal benefits of agroforestry to pollinator populations. So we found significant, significantly higher populations of hoverflies, bumblebees and uh, solitary bees in agroforestry than in arable fields. And there were, there were particularly strong effects on these smaller solitary bee species. And these are particularly vulnerable to extinction, to not necessarily extinction, but to population declines. Um, and they're very sensitive to disturbance. So this suggests, again, that the agroforestry is providing um, these habitat corridors throughout the field for these um, more vulnerable species. So what does all this mean for food production and for income in agroforestry? Well, we compared um, yields of um, of organic oats and of wheat and barley. So this, this bottom line here should, should read um, wheat slash barley. Um, and on the left, we're looking at the agroforestry system. On the right, we're looking at the arable. So for the organic oats, there wasn't any significant difference in average yield between the agroforestry alleys and the arable fields. Whereas for the wheat or barley, there was a, a slight reduction of about uh, 10 or 11 percent, I think, on average in the agroforestry fields. So this suggests that oats um, are quite, work quite well in agroforestry systems. They're probably quite competitive against weeds. They're also more resistant to slug damage um, and they possibly compete with trees for the light a bit better as well. We also did some economic modelling, which I haven't got time to go, to get, to go into in any detail. Um, now, but um, we found that agroforestry can increase farm income, but only after several years, so at least seven years, we found really, um, probably more than that. Um, but it, it can be more profitable within the within a 20 year lifespan of apple trees. But it, this profitability really heavily depends on the yield and price of the tree crop, which in this case was apple trees. So finally, I just want to mention an experiment we did comparing management of the vegetation below the trees to the understory. And in this experiment, uh, we just focused on one farm in Nottinghamshire, and we compared unmown uh, or infrequently mown flowering vegetation below the trees to a regularly mown treatment to suppress the flowers. So really, this was asking the, asking the question, how important is this? vegetation understory for biodiversity. And we found that there were multiple benefits of these having these flowering, tall flowering understories below the trees. So for example, there were significantly more pollinators visiting apple flowers above the flowering understories. There were more predators early in the season in the trees. There were fewer apple aphids in the trees, uh, which is quite interesting, above the flowering understories. And that also translated to a, a reduction in apple fruit damage from aphids. There was a higher diversity of um, predators and parasitoids in the adjacent crop. Um, there were significantly fewer numbers of sun pests, so particularly thrips. And we also did some economic modeling on that and, and found that farm income um, was higher under the, uh, the flowering management primarily because of the reduction in um, apple damage from aphids. So just to conclude, um, I hopefully explain that agroforestry increases plant and insect or invertebrate diversity. And really it it's leads to a shift towards a more natural community. So the traits associated with um, perenniality in plants, for example, and less winged invertebrates. But we found mixed effects on pests and weeds. 
So it really leads to a change in pest management, which can be explained in terms of their traits. But there were consistent benefits to pollinators. And we found that yield effects seem to depend on crops. So oats seem to be a good option in these systems. And finally, the flapping understories um, can enhance the, uh, the beneficial aspects of biodiversity in agroforestry. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd be very happy to take any questions or comments. Brilliant, thanks very much for that, Tom. That was great to hear just that wide range of impacts that you'd looked at on how agroforestry can affect biodiversity and in the UK as well. Um, we're starting to look more in farming at pests and beneficials in a very different way, a more holistic way. Um, and so that final experiment in particular, where you're looking to work with nature to help you with your pest control um, is fascinating. It, what a great bit of evidence to have um, on how an agroforestry system can work. Um, if any of you have any questions, please do keep them coming through in the Q&A about Tom's work. And thank you again for those that have come through. Um, so now we're moving closer to the Q&A session. We have closed up with our talks um, for the evening, but I am still very excited to introduce another person and another perspective on the whole story of agroforestry and nature-friendly farming in the UK. Um, I have Helen Cheshire here with us, who is the leading farming advocate for the Woodland Trust. Um, responsible for working with the farming sector and policy makers to promote the benefits of trees on farms um, to join us for a panel session. Um, so yeah, trees on farms, as I'm sure you know by now, is otherwise known as agroforestry. So the deliberate integration of trees and then agricultural crops and livestock. Um, Helen is representing the Woodland Trust in DEFRA Elm test on agroforestry, as well as being the leading as leading the Trust's involvement in several partnership projects um, delivering agroforestry across the UK. The Woodland Trust can provide advice and support to farmers interested in agroforestry via their trees and farm scheme. So do um, get in contact with Helen if you'd like to know more about that. Um, Helen also outside of the Woodland Trust grew up on a mixed livestock and um, mixed livestock farm in the Midlands. Uh, so Helen, I'm um, very pleased to introduce you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Before we do go into the Q&A, would you mind giving us two minutes, please, on your perspective of agroforestry and nature-friendly farming? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, can hear you well, yeah, thanks, yeah. Helen. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Georgina, for inviting me today. So yes, I think um, we've given me a good introduction, but yeah, I think it's agroforestry is really coming of age, as we've heard, it's a traditional, a traditional tool in the farmer's toolbox that's perhaps been neglected and not really ever taken up at mainstream levels in the UK. But I think with the climate and um, nature crisis, then it's really got a place to play and to, to deliver that, to, to help deliver some of the solutions to those problems whilst continuing to deliver healthy food production. So I think it really does offer that win-win-win. So I won't take up any more time now, but you know we've got we are involved in a research project which is looking at the impacts of what would happen if we roll out agroforestry at scale in terms of tackling the climate change and biodiversity crises together. So we will be launching that those findings in the early summer. But um, yeah, thanks very much, Georgina. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, I would now like to welcome the whole panel, please, to join back on video. And the audience, you will only be able to see the faces of people talking at any one time. Um, but I'm now going to start going through some of the questions that we've had. So thank you for all of those questions so far. Um, and thank you, Stephen and Jenny have started to answer some of them, but I'm going to kick off with something slightly different and looking. So we've got people who have joined us here, it seems from far and wide across Britain and further afield. And we talked mostly about agroforestry in England. Um, apart from Stephen, you've mentioned things about further afield. And there are people who are wanting to know about how agroforestry may work over in Ireland. Uh, 
heavily partial dominated system and over in Scotland as well. Um, so there are slightly different environments there. Scotland's certainly getting colder and less daylight hours. Um, Stephen, could you give a bit of an idea on how agroforestry could work in those systems? Um, yeah, so the um, there's a lots of factoids about fruits and nuts, you know, that they can only grow them in this part of the country. Um, most of it's absolute nonsense with no real hard evidence. The, the distribution of fruits and nuts is far more linked to access to markets, not soil and climate. So distance to London, you know, that was a key thing in the old days. So Kent is no better at producing fruits and nuts than any other county. The key issue is the microclimate. So you need windbreaks, you need to be aware of your rainfall levels and you need to select the varieties for those areas. So I, I don't see any problem in growing fruits and nuts in, in most of Scotland and most of Ireland. It's, the, it's creating the microclimate. So walnuts really shiver in the wind. So you've got to protect them from wind. Don't put things in a frost pocket. It's these site things, you know, on your farm. Do that. Don't worry about latitude or elevation that can be sorted. Um, obviously, the soils is a key thing. So chestnuts not going to be happy if the soils are uh, acid. So, you know, if, if they're too alkaline. Or, but, you know, I think there's far too much uh you know olive oliver rackham used this term factoid to mean all the stuff in gardening books and forestry books which i don't quite know where it came from but it's recycled without evidence you know it's and so-called experts come along and cite this stuff and it's really nonsense um and you know if you want to try it do it on a small scale um and, and, and so any, any failures won't, won't be too much of a problem. Brilliant, thank you for that, Stephen. Um, I'm now going to move over to a question about securing funding. Um, so there is, somebody's asked a question about if we secured funding and how in our agroforestry project, but then I'm also going to use that an opportunity for people who might want to secure funding and go over to Helen next to say if you could say a little bit more about that. So if you could go Sophie first, then Helen. Um, yeah, so in terms of did we secure funding, um, in terms of external grants or anything like that, we didn't. We um, did have some very generous donations from some supportive members of Hope Farm um, that went a long way to contribute this. and. Um, we generally as the farm try to stand the farm on its own in terms of finances but things like this and this sort of research is us pushing the boundaries that we need to see how this works before we can advocate so we we do lean on did lean on the RSPB funding a little bit for that um, but in terms of external grants then I think Helen would be able to offer a bit more information. Thanks Sophie. Yeah, so there's limited um, funding opportunities at the moment, certainly in England. Um, the Woodland Trust has been running a small Trees for Your Farm scheme for the last eight years. That's funded through corporates funding us to, to deliver, deliberately to, um, help support the delivery of trees on farms. So that provides free advice through our outreach uh, advisors and also heavily subsidised trees and protection. So we work with the farmer to design a scheme a simple application round um, and then if approved we, we provide you the trees and guards which are UK sourced and grown um, but it's really a pilot scheme so over the last eight years we've helped 190 schemes be created throughout the UK and they're everything from sort of arable through to um, shelter belts and browsing hedges in the uplands but um, as Georgie mentioned I'm also part of all the Woodland Trust is one of four partners in the Nelm test on agroforestry so we're working really, really hard to convince DEFRA that agroforestry should be supported going forward. Obviously, DEFRA didn't take up the cap up options in agroforestry in the last round. So we know that they are, you know, they publicly announced that they want to pilot an agroforestry standard in the um, sustainable farming incentive. 
So we're working behind the scenes to work with farmers who are both practicing agroforestry and interested in it to get their thoughts on how that, is, that standard should be um, designed. But we also feel very strongly that agroforestry should be supported through the local nature recovery, which is the component too. And I've got colleagues working in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland who are trying to convince the equivalent governments over there to support it. So I think going forward, there'll be more, there should be more government support. But also, I think there'll be opportunities in the private sector. Um, but again, you know, at the moment, it's quite challenging. Um, so I did put the link right at the beginning of the chat to our schemes. But as I say, it, they do get a very oversubscribed, but we're keen to help where we can. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Um, and I think another one thing to touch on there, there's the funding, but also the, the advice that's needed along with it, which I think Stephen's um, picked up on in his talks as well. Um, so now moving to something a bit, moving over to the practitioner side of things, and people have asked about spray drift, um, potential issues, effects of cult, uh, cultivations on uh, root and root pruning, and if there are any issues of the cropping system that people have found or the livestock system on the trees themselves. And I think quite a few people here might be able to impart some knowledge on that and um, we're very much at the learning stage although um, we have Sophie it'd be great to hear what we've done to try and mitigate those um, but if anyone else has that could share their experience that would be great. Uh, yeah I can just quickly talk about what we've planned for so um, as I mentioned in my presentation we have gone for six metre uh, strips of tree lines which is quite a lot larger than you generally see in these systems you generally see three or four meters um, and there's two main reasons for that three main reasons for that actually one of which is so that we have got some travel room so that if we need to get on the field to see to the trees whilst there are crops in the alleys either side we can fit an ATV down those strips without having to go on our crops um, another reason is so that we've got a really large understory and we've got a good biodiversity haven there, but also a really technical and important thing is that we have got a little bit of room if there was a bit of spray drift or there was a bit of um, an accident um, and there, you know, our, our contractor is very good and I would like to hope that that's not going to happen, but we've got a good meter either side before we're anywhere near those trees or that real understory. So we've given ourselves extra room in those strips so that hopefully that's not an issue. Um, and in terms of the tree roots, um, our plan is to subsoil down along those strips for the first few years annually. Um, this is something that we've heard from several other practitioners that are more advanced in their systems than we are. Um, and the thought process behind that, I mean, again, we're six metres into our crops, so we have given our tree roots plenty of room under there. But the thought of the subsoiling along the tree lines is that if any of them are coming out, you cut them off and then you're training the tree to go down rather than out so that it's actually searching for nutrients and it's searching for things away from your crops um, and obviously we have got field maps so we've put the tree lines not on top of the drains. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you Sophie and Stephen I've got a hand up from you so if you would like to impart your perspective on that that would be great. Well for me the, the main thing is we sh should be no spray you know there's no doubt we're now in a different world you know so we've got fertile we've got fertilizer at a thousand pound a ton that's up from, you know, a couple of hundred quid. We've, we know that the sprays, that we can't trust the manufacturers or the government's guidance on sprays. They're far more toxic than we ever imagined. So for me, it's quite simple. No spray. What does that mean? It means we're changing our mindset from having clinically clean fields of wheat to something else that's maybe more profitable if we reduce the sprays or if we have none at all. If in terms of feeding people, what do we feed people on? Well, buckwheat, you know, that could be quite good. If you grow in cereals, grow with incredible populations. Now, I'm making bread from at the moment from about 20 heritage varieties of wheat. The heritage varieties are completely different. They're like a different species. 
tall things with incredible rooting, completely different mycorrhizal associations. So we need to open our eyes to the challenge of no spray. You know, we need some creative thinking, lateral thinking. You know, and, and, and you know, if we if we're interested in wildlife, it's no spray. There is no alternative. That, that that's very clear to me. So that's my comment on spray. It should drift <laughs> completely away from the scene, hopefully on another planet or somewhere else. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. It's great to have that perspective as well. I mean, we at Hope Farm, we're insecticide free, but we still do use sprays and they're part of our system. Um, working conventionally, boils, well, I shouldn't use conventional, working with use of sprays and non-organically, but learning a lot of lessons from organic. Um, we're reducing our use as much as possible. But there is always going to be that risk um, with using herbicides and things that we don't 100% know what we do, which is why they really should be a last resort. Um, so before the spray, moving... The sprays are, sprays are unconventional. You travel the world and you look at history. The conventional way of growing crops is without spray. Yeah. It's just this pe peculiar period in history where we thought poisons were useful. That's unconventional and we should get away from it and find out, you know, so I'm at the moment bidding for some major work in the Tian Shan range in Central Asia, where we've got the walnut and apple forest. That's where walnut and apple came from. And they coexist, you know, in there with powdery mildew and scab. There's about a thousand different ecotypes of apple. We, we, we just, you know, we need, just need to ask the question, what does no spray look like? Where are the resources? Because it's growing there in the world without spray, you're getting good crops, tremendous diversity. We, we have lost all that. You know, how many different apple varieties, even the cider varieties, we think, wow, you know, we've got so many English cider varieties. That diversity is very restricted when you look at the DNA. We need to go back to the Tian Shan range and get real diversity and with that diversity you don't need sprays you'll get something out at the end the mm. same as what Martin Wolf did with his populations mixed populations you know that's the way forward so you know you might have set up your trial in the RSPB to so-called you know con <laughs> conventional I'd kick it into touch as soon as possible <laughs> I think I, I've, I've had my wrist slap for, we lean on conventional, but conventional suggests normal, which it certainly shouldn't be. Right, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, I have quite a few questions coming into you, Jenny, about walnuts. Um, is there any literature and history on walnuts of the UK? How you can purchase wet walnuts and people wanting to purchase grafted walnut trees from you so is there somewhere that these people can go to learn an awful lot more about walnuts and where to get them from? Um, well, uh, walnut literature I'm going to defer to Steve on that one he right. would be the expert for that. Um, in terms of buying wet walnuts there are I mean including myself so we're at Lower Dairy Farm uh, you can buy them online and we do post across the UK there are lots of other little orchards who do that too um, grafted walnut trees, uh, we're in the, this is the first year that we've been doing it, but that is something that we hope to um, develop in the future because we have got some very unusual varieties and some of which are the only examples of growing in an orchard of that particular variety. So that's a way to preserve them and also share them and hopefully spread that genetic diversity around the country. Uh, so yeah, you can look us up, which is Lower Dairy Farm, but um, do just search for wet walnuts and there are people selling them across the country. Um, so you will be able to get hold of them. Uh, you just have to look for them. And I'll hand over to Steve for walnut literature. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, um, the best books on walnut are in French. So um, Le Noyer by Eric Germain is the, is the main one to look at. That look compares the different French methods of growing walnut. Um, again, it needs to be updated though because it's very spray de dependent um, but but in terms of training and all the methods so it's Le Noyer by Eric Germain that's that's the key text in terms of grafted walnut trees um, you can get them from Frank Matthews quite a few suppliers but the the most exciting area at the moment is the um, 
Tame Brothers, they have two companies, Granary Oils and Warwickshire Walnuts. So they're keen on, on cranking up processing nuts for oils. And they're also uh, quite, they've got an incredible planting now of, of different grafted walnuts and they want to move into supplying the trees. But we're, it's early days yet. So I I had to import all mine from Germany. You heard Jenny talking about that trial. But, so there was one planted down at Boxstead and at the same time I planted some in uh, Middle Claydon um, with my other trials. Um, mm -hmm. Wet walnuts, yeah, well, wet walnuts are difficult to find because they don't store very long, so it's very risky business. Um, but there's more interested, and I hope to re establish the Walnut Club that was um, originally set up with East Morling, and it was more popular than all the fruit clubs put together. Um, but with the reorganisation of East Morning, it's died away. But I'd love to set up that network again. If anybody knows of any funding to help us do that, then a Walnut Club would be fantastic where we can share this information and do exposure visits, uh, which is the best way. The best way is to do what we call an exposure visit, where we take a group of landowners, processing people, a mixed bunch you know along the whole value chain and we take them to France or Germany or wherever so for hazelnut it would be superb to do that to Oregon because Oregon is how we should be growing hazelnuts not the way we grow them in Kent you know we've been doing it for 600 years in Kent and we've still not doing it the right way Oregon knows how to do it so exposure visits again if we could get funding for that that would be incredibly useful. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I've got a question now that's thinking more about biodiversity um, and how, what the impact of agroforestry is on that. And so Sophie and Tom, I have a question here about um, declining bird populations and the impact of agroforestry on birds. And so what the impact of the agroforestry is on birds, um, your experience, Tom, and also what we think the impact is for farmland birds, a lot of which use open farmland. So corn buntings, lapwings, skylarks, they are all open farm, um, open field species. Uh, what do we think is, will be the impact there? And Tom, what's your, what have your findings been so far? Yeah, so, um, so of course I didn't specifically Look at anything that big in my study it was all creepy crawlies um so uh i don't personally have any direct experience or data on that um however what we did find and i think what we can generalize is that agroforestry really changes the, the community so we can say agroforestry is good for biodiversity which i think generally it is but the the reality is a bit more nuanced than that. So it's not that every species on your farm will benefit from having trees on your farm. Um, there will be winners and losers. And um, and I'm, I'm no ornithologist, so Sophie might be able to comment more specifically on, on farming birds. Um, but certainly by planting trees, you're going to benefit a lot of species which uh, favour um, tree cover and hedgerows and those kind of habitats. Um, possibly at the expense of more open field species. Although of course, the design of the agroforestry system will have a big influence on that. And, and agroforestry is of course a very broad term. Um, so possibly if, if you have very wide alleys um, that could help mitigate some of that um, potential harm to, uh, to open field species. But um, yeah, Sophie might be able to comment more specifically on, on that. Um yeah yeah i can a little bit um so obviously we're very keen to monitor our bird populations in our field and we can't give you our specific data yet but um we know a fair amount about birds at the rspv and we are we have run another project um in a different part of the organization looking at nature-based solutions and rolling that out on country scale and what the trade-offs are because there are always going to be trade-offs with these different options 
Um, and when we look at increasing tree cover and increasing agroforestry systems, one of the clear losers is farmland birds. And that is obviously a big concern of ours because they're already losing in the systems that we currently have. So they continue to lose or lose even more. That is a worry. Um, part of the reason I should have mentioned that we picked the field that we have for our trial is because it is only 11 hectares. We are very fortunate that we have a very comprehensive data set of farmland well, of all of our wildlife on our farm, because that's part of the Hope Farm remit. And we know that that field is of very, very, very little interest to those types of species. Um, it doesn't house lapwings or skylarks or corn buntings on any given year for in terms of territories and breeding. Um, so we know we're not really at risk of displacing any by putting the trial in that field. The field next to that one to the left, which was not on the map, is a much, much larger field, a sort of 25 hectare field in the middle of our farm and that is our lapwing field and our uh, prime skylark field that's where you'll find a lot of territories for those types of birds and if we had put agroforestry in there there is there would have been a really huge risk that we would just displace those species um however we might see some other benefits so things like lapwing they need open nesting while they're on their nests and while they're on their eggs but they don't, the parents don't bring food to the chicks. They take the chicks with them along the ground and they look for inverts for them to eat. So having the agroforestry system next door, which is potentially increasing our invertebrate population in that field, might mean that when the chicks are mobile, the adults have got um, another feeding resource. So that might be a potential benefit, but it just wouldn't be a benefit while they're nesting. Um, so that's part of your planning. That's part of your consideration. If you know your farm and you know um, not necessarily bird species, I'm not expecting all farmers to be able to identify any of these birds, but you have an idea of different habitats on your farm, then you can try and provide for all of them. I don't think any of us would advocate putting your entire farm into tree cover because there's always going to be some type of loser in that situation, but there's definitely ways you can try and mitigate um, and do different things to help that. Brilliant. Thank you, Sophie. And Stephen's got his hand up as well. So I'd like to hear what you've got to say on that as well, Stephen. You're on mute. So three points then. So um, where to start? The alley cropping in the scheme of things over the next 50 years, we'll look, we'll look back on that as an oddity that it won't be very widespread. It, so in order to do agroforest, we need to think on a bigger scale, on, on the estate scale or the farm scale, and do pockets and clumps and, and thick hedgerows. So that's the first thing to think about, um, you know, the, the scale. So we have this word farmer. Well, are we dealing with farmers or are we dealing with landowners? If we're dealing with landowners, are we dealing with someone like the Ministry of Defence? We've got massive state landowners. So when we look at the link between birds and agroforestry landscapes, the MOD scale is, is slightly different from an alley cropping system in one field in Cambridge. So we must be very careful with these ideas and think very much about scale and whether we're working with the farmer uh, a tenant farmer or, or a landowner. You know, I'm, I'm working upwards, you know, I'm currently working on a 3,000 acre estate and Mr. Lapwing, Mr. and Mrs. Lapwing are on our design panel. So, so you want a thousand walnuts or a thousand hazels, talk to the Lapwing family and they'll say, put them over here and don't put them there, no problem. Don't say, don't do agroforestry, it's bad for lapwings. This is ridiculous generalization. Stick them on the design. What species do you want? You know, they put them on the design panel and you can plant the trees. You know, think of them just as much as you are thinking about the ergonomics of using farm machinery. Yeah, I, th um, I, think, it, I think it's all about into thinking about the different stakeholders in the land, isn't it? So you've, you've got different things to use it, so the farmland birds and thinking about what what different fields can be best used for different things well so i just visited elmley so i, I we um 
you know, I'm in Kent at the moment in Faversham. I spend every other day on Ore Marsh, which is probably one of the best bird sites in Europe, and, and look at the agroforestry potential around that and the, and the Thames catchment, you know, that scale, how can agroforestry fit in? And then this Elmley private nature reserve, they're very clear about what birds they want to promote and what kind of paying visitors they would get for different birds. Um, so it's part of the design of the agroforestry system. Um, put down the limiting factors in your design, look at the design chapter in the Soil Association book, you know, it's all part of design. The alley cropping stuff and the silver pastoral stuff, don't forget that came from crazy people like me <laughs> doing research. We needed these funny little systems to get replication, lots of little squares. They were wonderful for research and we needed them to fail. We wanted to plant them so close that, that we wanted to plot the, you know, the correlation between light and yield or whatever. Unfortunately, every time I took farmers to see my research trials, I would say, please don't think that I know what I'm doing. Please, whatever I say, take it with a pinch of salt. I just live my life making mistakes. And science is all about making mistakes. Please don't scale up what I'm doing. Please don't think this is a demonstration. So I'd take them round and we'd go and do it. And... The message never got across there try and replicate what I did you know I'm I'm just saying that walnuts are good poplars are good if you stick them in the right place in groupings but we can tell you a bit about what not to do about closing them planting them too closely so I think we need to look at the landscape scale and when we look at nature-based solutions we need to look at the zone so the peri-urban zone is absolutely critical we call it in Kent, we're calling this the green life jacket. At 2.4 degrees, we need to be thinking of the green life jacket, which is a, a buffer zone two kilometres around the edge of every urban settlement. So we've measured out Faversham, which is one kilometre radius. Now we're looking at this polo mint, the out, outer ring of two kilometres, this green space, seven times the area of the town. And for food security, climate resilient, climate change resilient, this is the future landscape for agroforestry. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. And I think I think it is, yeah, it's important to look at planning. I, I, I love the persistence of the alley cropping, perhaps not being the way forward. We'll see how it works at Hope Farm and some other systems. Um, because that'll yeah, be really really interesting to see how it pans out. Um, I'm going to move on now to ask, I've got a question for Helen Cheshire, perhaps to give a perspective on how some of the different systems are planned out in your schemes and who you work with. Um, it, well, it, yeah, we, well, we work with a really diverse range of farmers, um, including a few tenants, although they make up a smaller proportion because of that barrier which I think is a you know is a barrier that needs to be removed in terms of improving opportunities for tenant farmers but we very much work with both upland and lowland farmers and you know have de delivered all sorts of different designs so they're mainly some are from some of them are from big estates they're mainly what I would call sort of family farming businesses and a good proportion of them are I suppose well on their journey of regenerative farming so the innovators probably is you know to be said so they do make and like Stephen says they make brilliant demonstration farms so we do work closely with quite a few of them and they're always very willing to show other farmers what they're doing and I think that is you know, that is the way to learn and to sort of share experiences mm. um, but yeah a bit of everything brilliant thank you Helen um, so we are getting towards the end of the webinar now so I'm just scouring through and seeing what final questions to finish on um, we've got Two more. A couple of people were asking about squirrels, so I would like a one sentence answer. I'm sure Jenny, with your farming and walnuts, you'll have some experience with squirrels. Steve, and I'm sure you'll have a bit to say about squirrels. And Helen, if you have any experiences with any of the farmers you've worked with and 
the squirrels deer I think have been mentioned as well if there is I would like these two sentences from each of you on what experiences you had and what perhaps people could do to mitigate those potential issues Okay, I'll go first. Um, well, ideally don't plant in the middle of woodland. Uh, and second sentence, if you have a solution to it, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Stephen. So, I mean, the it's really a moral issue, you know, what, so how you see the squirrels. So do you want to eat squirrel sausages? That could be an incredible byproduct. Um, the, uh, so, do, what what about the contraception ideas for squirrels that's been investigated by the Forestry Commission? Do you would you like the idea of a live trapping and then drive in your car and do some antisocial behaviour <laughs> and drop them on another farm? What's your what's your value system? What are your morals? So it's part of the management, part of the design. So they're going to be with us. So you better be wary of them. They're incredibly hungry. Um, on the walnuts that we planted in, similar to the ones we planted at Jenny's place, um, we found that rooks were equally um, a problem. Um, and then on the site, we, they, they got really fed up because there's an, an auction house next to the site. And the, um, the rooks were demonstrating, they were dropping the walnuts on top of the auction house trying to crack the nuts so that was a completely unpredictable problem okay interesting suggestions on the squirrels um yeah. and yeah there, there are other things going on as well helen have you had any experiences with farmers and squirrels or other um grazing mammals or anything that might be an issue and I think the, beyond the points that have already been made, the main thing would be to say is it's part of the planning process that you really do make sure that you're aware of what your local pests are, because, yeah, that, that can really alter the success of your scheme. And obviously, you know, you can make plans to try and limit them. But yeah, it's a major, major issue in certain parts. Of the Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. So one final question i would like to hear from each of you where would be the best place to or provide a place please for people to get further advice on agroforestry and i think we'll finish up finish up on that if we could start with helen please well, I have to say the Woodland Trust, otherwise, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's what, one option. Obviously, as I say, we do provide advice and guidance, but I will also take the opportunity to mention Farm Ed, which is um, perhaps a new, a new person on the block, uh, the demonstration farm in Oxfordshire run by Cotswold Seeds, and they're creating a living agroforestry textbook in a lowland farm situation, so showing lots of different types of agroforestry in, in, on the one farm. And they're also running some excellent courses. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Sophie? Um, yeah, so we definitely uh, did a lot of reading. There's some good books. There's the Soil Association Handbook, um, Steve's book on um, temperate agroforestry systems. Um, but yeah, always the biggest advice came from people already doing it. So we had quite a few meetings with um, people like Stephen Briggs and people at Wakelands who run similar systems to what we're hoping to and took some lessons from them. Brilliant. Thank you, Sophie. Tom? Yeah, so um, I think a really good resource which has been mentioned already is the Agroforestry Handbook, um, which was published um, quite recently, I think a couple of years ago, uh, by the Soil Association. Um, so yeah, search online for that agroforestry handbook. Um, that's available as a as a PDF download, and it's I think as a scientist anyway, it's it's really good kind of evidence based um, advice on on those people thinking of uh, setting up or designing agroforestry systems. Brilliant, thank you, Tom. Stephen, I'm, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear people advocating a book you've helped to write. Um, and I have also got someone on the Q and A who would like you to have your own TV show. By the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but my dog's interested she uh, <laughs> she's more photogenic than i am so i could do a ventriloquist act 
Johnny Morris. Well, you probably wouldn't remember Johnny Morris. I don't know whether it's politically correct anymore. Um, yeah, so right from the start then, the most important place is YouTube. So, but the thing is that it, you, you need to ask the question. The question is the thing, not the answer. So potatoes, you want to learn about potatoes and an agroforestry crop. There's some incredible empirical gardeners. So these are people that don't believe all the rubbish in the books. They test things out for themselves. They measure it. So how to grow potatoes. So that's very good. So then you need to think about what are the questions about the tree crops? Well, the first thing is the incredible range of things we can be growing in the face of climate change. So we've got mulberry, we've got quince, we've got sea buckthorn, we've got acorns, we've got stone pine, we've got almond, we've got chestnut. This is what we should be doing. These are all getting more appropriate with climate change. They're better conditions. So again, if you want to find out about them, even hazel, look on YouTube. Places to visit, I mentioned Oregon for hazel. Um, and then, you know, the farmers of 50 centuries, China. So if there's only one place you could ever go to learn about mechanized agroforestry, it's China. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. And Jenny, where would you say to go for agroforestry advice? Um, Stephen's book, obviously, there were also some really good agroforestry podcasts, which are worth looking at. Uh, the agroforestry podcast is one of them, um, which cover everything from alley cropping to silver pasture and forest stewardship through um, coppicing and through wood, uh, sort of uh, food, forest and wood management. So just dive in as much as you can and hopefully something will fit your farm and you'll get some ideas. Brilliant, thank you. And so on that note, I am going to wrap up this webinar and indeed the final webinar in the Hope Farm series for 2022. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you so much to the speakers and to the RSPB events team behind the scenes who have been cracking all the way through um, this series and getting all of us organised best we can. Um, and I hope to see you next year and enjoy the rest of your evening.